Hi there, and welcome to another academic half day for critical care medicine residents. Today we're going to talk about critical illness acquired weakness. Now critical illness acquired weakness is an important topic because it is very common and uh, it is important that you understand the fundamentals. So throughout the course of this talk, what we're going to cover are, uh, we're going to go through a little bit of, well, not a little bit, a fair chunk of pathophysiology to try to focus on the actual causes for critical illness, polyneuropathy, and polymyopathy. We'll go over all the risk factors so that you're aware of the things that you need to look for um, and uh, to watch out for when you're caring for a critically ill patient, and then describe an overall approach to the patient who is, critical, who is critically ill and you discover is acutely weak, uh, where there was no history prior. And then uh, finally close off with some treatment strategies in order to both prevent and treat uh, critical care acquired weakness. Critical illness acquired weakness is a, an incredibly important problem uh, that comes up in, in ICUs. It is something that is imperative that you understand and, uh, and can both watch out for and understand that the things that we do in, in ICUs are not without significant long-term consequences. On average, if you take all comers to an ICU who are admitted and then survive, almost 57% of them will, will require home assistance one year later if they require long-term ventilation. So, and in, in this case, long-term ventilation means uh, on a ventilator for more than two weeks. Um, so that's an awfully large number of people who are leaving the ICU in significant disability and requiring a significant amount of support after they've been in, uh, in an ICU. They survived their illness, won the battle, but ultimately they may lose the war. When you look at patients who, who leave the ICU, the, really the first six months are, are the most important time um, for, for uh, repair and recovery and rehabilitation. As in the first six months, that's when you're going to see uh, the most marked improvement. And beyond that point, there is more of a plateau and not really as much, uh, as much aggressive recovery as, as can occur, despite the level of rehabilitation the patient's receiving. Obviously, as you can expect, that many people who have uh, come into the hospital with uh, a significant number of premorbid conditions or a high degree of frailty has a significant role in the overall outcomes for these patients. Age is also a significant factor with uh, patients being younger, um, fortunately for me, uh, 43 years or, or younger, who develop uh, weakness um, are much more likely to have a better recovery. But then all you have to do in, is add 10 years and a couple of premorbid conditions and the outcomes become far worse. In, in previous studies, the addition of 10 years to the patient population and the addition to additional uh, premorbid conditions such as uh, diabetes or ischemia or any of those other number of, of things that patients walk into the hospital with um, had a significant impact on their outcomes. And in that population, only about 9% of them were alive and independent at one year. Many of them were alive, but independence was the problem. So you can see just how important this problem is and the scope of the problem that we, we create when patients come into the ICU uh, and we treat them for their critical illness. Now let's say you are on service, you have a patient who's been sick for quite some time and it's time for them to wake up and see what they can do and start getting better. You wake them up and they're acutely weak. So. How are you going to approach that? Now, this is off not an uncommon problem as a large number of people are not discovered to be weak until they begin the actual process from weaning from mechanical ventilation um, and when they wake up from their critical illness. So, uh, so you should expect to see this um, uh, fairly regularly. <laughs> 
when you're presented with acute weakness in the ICU, it is important that you go back and review the history and make sure that there's uh, that there's nothing else that could have uh, been complicating their their presentation. And a good history and physical will help pick up other causes. So if the patient presented to hospital initially with a, a distal bilateral motor weakness, and then there may have been some either gastro um, uh, enteric or uh, viral prodrome, you have to consider the possibility that this person might actually have Guillain-Barre syndrome. If they're uh, uh, a trauma patient and they're hypo-reflective and quadriplegic, then that actually raises the question of a spinal cord injury that was missed uh, on the original screening. Unilateral weakness is not uncommon given the number of patients, uh, given the way we position a lot of our patients, and and it's not uncommon or unexpected to see a, a plexoplasty, uh, a plexopathy, sorry, um, occur either as a result of a previous trauma or from positioning through through their ICU stay. Similarly, if they have a, a single nerve distribution uh, weakness, then you should be much more uh, concerned of the development of a, a compression neuropathy uh, as opposed to a more systemic problem. Now those kinds of presentations are a little unusual and, and to be honest you probably would have picked up on on some of those uh, clues prior to the patient being woken up from mechanical ventilation. I mean somebody who's got a missed spinal cord injury you really have to ask yourself the question why did you not check the C-spines? Why did you not make sure that there was no injury to the neck? Um, it should be part of a routine trauma uh, admission that, uh, that the, the uh, spinal cord has been uh, properly imaged. The more common way you're going to see these patients present is, is uh, with a failure to wean from mechanical ventilation. And 30% of the population of, of acutely weak patients, that is their, find, their, their, their primary uh, presentation. So when you have somebody who has a failure to wean, you also then need to re-ask the question and rule out other causes, things such as cardiac causes. So if somebody's got um, an underlying history of ischemic heart disease, are they having a essentially um, a uh, episodes of silent ischemia while they're trying to be weaned from mechanical ventilation. In other words, their myocardium and their uh, coronary arteries are not sufficient to uh, to take up the workload, and uh, and they're having um, silent ischemia. Um, you also, if the person has uh, failure to wean, you should also ask yourself whether there's other pulmonary reasons why they may not. Um, may not be able to fly. And things uh, as obvious as things that decrease the compliance of the lungs, ARDS being the most common cause, should be blindingly obvious to you. But then more occult causes such as uh, pulmonary embolisms which did not manifest themselves um, uh, from a hemodynamic state, so you didn't actually see them hemodynamically, may create a dead space problem sufficient that they're not actually weaning very fast. Next, if there's, if there's a, a traumatic injury, um, again, you have to wonder whether or not the, uh, uh, the integrity of the rib cage is to blame for their inability to wean. Again, this is something that you should probably have already uh, noticed on your original uh, screening, um, but it is certainly a possibility uh, and can manifest itself um, a little less, a little bit but, uh, more, more, um, more subtly. Um, because the number of other injuries may have distracted you from the fact that the ribs were actually significantly injured. And then finally, you should also make sure that you exclude any other central neurological conditions that may be, con uh, may be causing them to uh, fail to wean. This can include things that are psychological, like anxiety and uh, PTSD, and also and to the more obscure central causes like uh, Odine's curse uh, or um, central pontine myelolysis. Uh, if there is a history of significant swings in uh, uh, osmotically active agents. Now the beauty of, of, uh, of ICU acquired weakness is that we do have ways we can try to localize the source of the problem. A good neurological exam will help provide clues, but then electrodiagnostic testing um, gives a chance to localize the source of the problem to the motor neuron, the neuromuscular junction, or directly within the muscles. So 
a good set of EMGs and nerve conduction studies can go a long ways in helping you understand what is going wrong with this patient. Now, in order to make the diagnosis, you need to have a number of different factors in, in play to, to, make, to really point to it and say that's the source of the problem. Obviously, the first thing that has to, uh, uh, has to be is that the patient actually has to have had been critically ill. I mean, obviously, they can't have critically ill acquired weakness if they weren't ever actually critically ill. Um, they have to have difficulty weaning from mechanical ventilation. Uh, there has to be uh, obvious uh, and uh, limb weakness when they're uh, examined. And then on electrophysiological studies, there has to be evidence of axonal motor and sensory polyneuropathies with the uh, presence of other co-founding uh, causes uh, excluded. And if you have those, then you pretty well have the diagnosis of ICU-acquired weakness. Now, in order to make the diagnosis of a critical illness uh, uh, polymyopathy, you need uh, some additional investigations. You need uh, a more formal EMG, uh, which will give you some more information. And as well, there is also some additional clues that you can, uh, you can gather to help make the diagnosis. If the person only has a critical illness polymyopathy, uh, as opposed to a polyneuropathy and myopathy, which can occur uh, concurrently, then you will see that the uh, sensory nerve action, uh, action potential amplitude is greater than uh, 80%. This means basically that the uh, axons are working, at least the sensory nerve axons are working, and, uh, and are not responsible for the, for the weakness. The, a, a needle EMG will demonstrate a short duration, low amplitude uh, motor, urine, uh, motor, unit, motor unit action potential, which basically are uh, low amplitude response to stimulation uh, due to uh, the weakness lying at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, within the muscle itself. Uh, you should also expect to see a lo an absence of any decremental uh, response on repetitive nerve stimulation. So if you repeatedly stimulate the nerve, if the patient had something similar to a myasthenia gravis, then they would see a, a progressive decrement in the response. The absence of a decremental response excludes myasthenia and uh, uh, and confirms or uh, points towards a, a, polyneurop a polymyopathy as the cause. Occasionally in unusual s cases where the diagnosis is not really clear or in cases where a muscle biopsy was being performed for uh, other reasons, uh, you may get histopathology. And this will show there, there's a preferential loss of myosin uh, within each of the, um, uh, within the muscle cells. There is, um, occasionally you can see an elevation in the CK uh, as the muscle is being broken down from the polymyopathy. Uh, and also, finally, you can also see some muscle inexcitability as a uh, presenting feature for the uh, critical illness uh, myopathies. Now, to identify uh, the risk factors that are associated with the development of uh, critical illness uh, polyneuropathy or critical illness myopathy, there have been uh, a large number of studies. Unfortunately, most of these studies tend to focus on the uh, risk factors for developing critical illness polyneuropathy as opposed to myopathy itself. And part of that may be because there are diseases that uh, are related and occur together and can cause, be caused by one another. For critical illness polyneuropathy, the major risk factors are the use of steroids, the severity of the illness of the, of the patient, uh, the presence of sepsis or SIRS, um, uh, uh, including microvascular uh, injury, and then uh, also there's a significant risk associated with hyperglycemia and uh, hypoalbuminemia. 
albuminemia, um, which in and of itself may not be a specific risk factor, but just a marker for uh, the, the uh, severity of illness. Um, but these factors are known to be associated with critical illness polyneuropathy. Critical illness myopathy, on the other hand, um, has, uh, it's, uh, has similar risk factors, um, such as uh, disease severity, uh, the presence of SIRS, the, but in, in addition also has uh, uh, the, uh, an additional risk factor is the use of uh, uh, catecholamines and, um, and the activation of insulin growth, uh, growth factor binding protein 1, uh, which seem to specifically uh, modulate and worsen uh, critical illness myopathy. But the overarching uh, risk factor for both of these conditions that you need to uh, be very sensitive to is the use of neuromuscular blockers and steroids. Both of these are known to cause uh, both a pure axonal motor neuropathy as well as a primary myopathy. So they independently can cause um, weakness of the uh, from either destruction of the neuron or destruction of the muscle or both. So it is absolutely essential that you watch for your use of neuromuscular blockers um, and, uh, and also try to limit your use of steroids as much as possible. All right, so now we get into the fun stuff. Um, now we can start focusing on some of the, on the pathophysiology for these conditions to really help you understand why they occur. It's one thing to say I can know the risk factors and I know the outcomes and I know how to treat it, but it's more important, in my opinion, to actually understand why these things are happening so you can understand things that you might be able to do that are not necessarily um, on the forefront of the uh, current understood evidence um, in large studies, but things that you might be able to do to actually reduce the risk of harm uh, to these patients and understand what directions the field is, uh, is going in, and never mind the fact that you'll just basically understand it better than most other people who just say, it's just weak, the patient's just weak. Well, it's more important that you understand why they're weak, not just in general, but at the microscopic level as well. And so to that end, we're going to go and break down the pathophysiology of critical illness uh, polyneuropathy separate from the critical illness uh, uh, polyneuromyopathy uh, uh, separately and explore those, those, those pathophysiologies because they are actually different. And as I have said before, even though they occur together and are frequently caused by one another. Okay, so to reiterate, poly, uh, critical illness polyneuropathy is a distal axonal sensory motor polyneuropathy. It makes no distinction, but the, the, the disease itself makes no distinction between motor versus sensory disease. It affects both, both of those axons equally. Now, on nerve conduction studies, what you see is a reduced amplitude of the uh, motor and sensory nerve action potentials, but the actual nerve conduction velocities are about the are, are about same or close to normal. What this means is that membrane depolarization defects uh, are probably the most the, the underlying cause of the axonal damage um, that is occurring. So the, it's not that it, that the that the neuron. Uh, or the axon rather is being broken down. It's just not able to fire uh, and send its amplitude, uh, send its signal uh, with the same uh, um, uh, same amplitude um, as as it could normally. Okay, so then how is this occurring? Well, if you look at the um, <clears throat> microscopically at the uh, axons uh, in the nerve bundles and their association with blood vessels, you see that the blood vessels are um, run fairly closely to all of the axons. Either uh, they're either in local direct contact or they're a little bit more peripheral. But either way, the microvasculature is in intimate uh, association with the axons themselves. <laughs> 
And as you are well aware, the development of a critical illness has significant influence on the microvascular architecture um, and the flow patterns and the activation of the endothelium. These alterations can then cause problems with hypoperfusion, hypoxia. Um, there can be a significant amount of endotoxin present in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the blood supply causing damage to the endothelium which then leads to inflammation locally, um, which further um, worsens the problem of the hypoxemia um, and the local injury and causing metabolites that lead to the buildup um, of further metabolites that then leads to problems with depolarization. As well, microvascular ischemia uh, exas is exacerbated by the loss of the small vessel autoregulation. When you get damage to these, these small vessels, uh, they lose their ability to autoregulate, and so their problem with, um, with reduced blood flow uh, directly proportional to reductions in the, uh, um, to the blood pressure. When the uh, blood vessel becomes uh, relatively hypoperfused, this causes um, further problems with uh, ischemia and because the vessel itself has lost the ability to autoregulate there's no way for it to compensate for that. Now it may seem like there's this, this just this free-for-all that, um, that there's no protection, that the nerves sit there um, laying out there exposed to this vascular environment and there absolutely is no protection against it Meanwhile, up in the brain, there's this blood-brain barrier that protects it from a lot of these effects to a degree. Fortunately for the nerves, there is actually a blood-nerve barrier um, which, you, um, which can help um, buffer the, the, uh, the nerves against this uh, uh, endo, uh, endotoxin, endothelial injury, and microvascularly toxic environment. However, the blood nerve barrier itself gets disrupted by critical illness um, and causes uh, um, in the development of advanced uh, glycolation byproducts, causes hyper uh, hypertrophy of the basement membrane, um, and then releases uh, injurious uh, growth factors such as transforming growth factor A, uh, sorry, transforming growth factor B. All of these um, perpetuate the problem essentially a toxic microvascular environment and the disruption of the of the nerve brain uh, sorry blood nerve barrier um, exposes it to even more of that while ironically also exposing it to worsening ischemia and hypoxemia all of these effects uh, uh, operate against the nerve and the axon specifically to reduce its ability to depolarize and reduces the amplitudes of their uh, of their action potentials. Now that being said, there is also uh, a bit of an undercurrent that I found in some of the readings, uh, especially in the uh, articles that are attached uh, for the fellows, uh, that involves the story of potassium. It has been known for quite some time that patients who have problems with chronic renal failure also have problems with significant weakness and, uh, and nerve, con nerve uh, uh, polyneuropathies. The effects of, uh, of critical illness on these, these patients um, is um, at least multi uh, multiplies the risk of them developing uh, uh, ICU-acquired weakness. So perhaps there might actually be a bit of a role for potassium in all of this. Some earlier studies have, I d have found that within the uh, microvascular space surrounding the axons, the, uh, um, the endoneural um, region is actually hyperkalemic uh, in critical illness. And this uh, relative hyperkalemia can then contribute to uh, depolarization of the axon's um, um, membrane potential. This is probably occurring because the axonal uh, slow potassium channels are activated uh, during an action potential and it helps generate the, uh, the late uh, sub-excitatory phase of recovery.
this means that essentially that the presence of this um, hyperkalemic environment tends to depolarize the cells and make them less, uh, uh, less responsive to action potentials. And if you recall from your uh, basic uh, cell physiology that the, uh, the strength of the action potential is directly related to the, um, to the degree with which it, can, uh, um, it depolarizes. Cells that are relatively depolarized prior to activation of the action potential tend to generate a lower amplitude action potential as a result. Part of this is at least in, due to the uh, um, probability inactivation of sodium channels uh, contributing to this. And in fact, when you look at uh, patients uh, who have this uh, acute reversible phase of uh, critical illness polyneuropathy, uh, it may act actually be due in part, at least, to the inactivation of sodium channels as opposed to actual uh, damage to the cells themselves. Now, that's all well and good. I mean, it's one thing to be worried about potassium, but just as a, uh, as a mind experiment, what would you think would happen uh, if you had a patient who was uh, relatively hypokalemic, or rather, I guess we should properly say ICU hypokalemic, meaning that their potassium, while certainly within the boundaries of what we usually consider normal, is not normal enough for the staff, and so there's some, uh, I don't know, potassium or electrolyte replacement protocol that is constantly injecting um, essentially boluses of, of uh, potassium into their, into their veins um, and creating a hyperkalemic environment. Possibly could it be that perhaps we may be contributing to the ICU-acquired weakness by our, man, our, our manic desire to uh, maintain a, uh, an electrolyte at a number in the absence of any evidence that producing that normal number actually has any impact on outcomes for the patient? that in fact may be causing them to be weaker and worsening their outcomes? One wonders. Now, it's one thing to say that potassium is bad, but then we also know that hyperglycemia or glucose is also bad as well. I mean, we've talked about how uh, ischemia and uh, hypoxia are bad on the nerves, but um, but then on the opposite side, supplying too much of a good thing can be just as bad. And the reason for that is you're creating an inflammatory environment, uh, and then you give them an excess load of glucose, and you basically cause an increased production of reactive oxygen species within the neurons. Remember, the neurons rely on oxidative phosphorylation almost primarily as their source of energy, and so producing a lot, giving them a lot of extra glucose creates a lot of extra um, uh, push for, um, for glycolysis and, uh, uh, and a push down the electron transport chain. But in the absence of, a, significant, of a, um, a sufficient amount of oxygen, you place the patient at risk for developing uh, a lot of reactive oxygen species, which is probably pretty bad um, for neurons. They don't like being bathed in uh, essentially hydrogen peroxide. Phosphate depletion also occurs as they are um, uh, producing a lot of excess ATP. Uh, it's depletion of the phosphate, um, and then it puts essentially puts some of the brakes on on the production of uh, more uh, more ATP, which uh, which then causes a buildup of these reactive oxygen species. Now, for any of you who know me personally, you also, you, you've probably heard me um, uh, scream that, uh, well, not scream, but you know, go on about how bad TPA is, that, uh, sorry, the TPN is uh, essentially poison. I mean, to me, it's, it only makes sense. You're injecting a uh, high concentration of glucose, uh, sugar, fats, and proteins directly into the, into the, uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, without having given it an opportunity to first pass through the liver and be properly uh, properly metabolized. Uh, and we do that when we have to, when we have no other option. But ultimately, in my view, TPN is bad. And, and in this case, I think it'd be especially bad for you because it creates a hyperglycemic load um, uh, on that the nerves then have to uh, to manage. And as well, you oxidize all this 
peripherally administered lipids, which causes further damage to the uh, neural microvasculature, um, and it impairs the transport of uh, axonal proteins, which uh, further debilitates and disables these uh, these poor axons. They're just trying to uh, just trying to pass on their messages. So, if at all possible, you should always avoid TPN if you can if you have access to their gut for. A, a whole host of other reasons, not only this one, um, but also just as an overarching rule, you should probably also avoid hypoglycemia if at all possible because the nerves are particularly sensitive to, um, to hyperglycemia, as we know occurs within the brain during brain injury. So let's switch gears now and uh, talk about the pathophysiology of critical illness polymyopathy um, and uh, get away from talking about the nerves and start talking about the muscles as well. So a critical illness polymyopathy can come on relatively quickly and it seems to uh, be the combined effects of decreased muscle mass as well as impaired contractility. Um, so, and it's not just a loss of, uh, of uh, muscle function, it's actually a loss of muscle itself. Um, and when you look at the, these, uh, these uh, injured muscles under the microscope, there seems to be a relative loss of myosin uh, over, uh, over actin. Many of the causes for this uh, this atrophy are not not really fully understood at this point. There's a lot of uh, different uh, animal models which don't entirely correlate with human uh, human findings, um, which kind of bounce back and forth between a variety of different uh, possible causes. What it seems to be occurring is that that there is normal ongoing muscle proteolysis. Um, occurring inside each of the muscles as it's cycling, recycling the use of uh, a lot of these uh, contractile proteins. And what seems to be occurring is that the, uh, that the breakdown of muscle is, um, is out of balance relative to the synthesis of the new proteins, uh, which leads to the atrophy. As I've, as I've said, a lot of this, uh, this um, uh, breakdown it seems to be more with the myosin uh, chains as opposed to the actin chains. Now the atrophy itself can be induced by a variety of different uh, causes, uh, mostly due to muscle inactivity, which doesn't necessarily have to be due to um, uh, uh, polyneuropathy, or sorry, from critical illness. Um, I, I mean, we see this happening with uh, astronauts when they return to space. They've had relative muscle inactivity. They haven't been appropriate. Their muscles haven't been uh, loaded, uh, and these unloaded muscles uh, tend to then shift the balance from synthesis and uh, proteolysis towards more towards breakdown, um, which then results in atrophy. As well, you can also see uh, muscle atrophy occurring uh, from denervation and the immobility both of which uh, occur within the critically ill population. We keep them immobile in bed and unconscious and then, uh, and then expect them to be able to run a marathon once we wake them up and start weaning them. Furthermore, and as I've alluded to several times, the, um, the presence of a uh, critical illness polyneuropathy actually can cause a poly, uh, critical illness polymyopathy. Um, and this is primarily due to the effects of denervation, or is, in a sense, uh, effective denervation, even if there is an actual loss of, of axons. Compounding all of these problems with, uh, with muscle uh, protein breakdown is the uh, developing the, the um, uh, uh, inflammatory response that shifts, the, shifts a lot of the body's uh, metabolic activity from anabolism to catabolism. Uh, inflammation also causes problems with um, uh, cellular energy stress from both microvascular uh, ischemia and also from a, a shunting of, uh, of uh, different metabolic pathways. And then if you fail to feed your patients, uh, you will get, uh, once you get um, 
once the patient's not getting an adequate number of calories and protein, well, their body is going to simply go finding other sources for those those uh, those resources, and it will mine the muscles until it gets as long until it gets what it needs. And so, all of these things can contribute to uh, the mustrophy that we see in cr critical illness uh, polymyopathy. Compounding this uh, increased breakdown of muscle uh, proteins is also reduction in the protein synthesis. Um, that occurs uh, that's supposed to balance, counterbalance the uh, the muscle breakdown that we that that uh, that is abnormal to a degree, um, and a lot of this is also induced by the uh, immobility of the patient as well as the development of a systemic inflammatory state. Once you get inside the cell, the, there's further problems than just breakdown of, of uh, muscle. There's also problems with the, over, with the uh, actual strength of the contractions and direct contractile dysfunction. The, the, the inability to generate a, uh, a force uh, within the muscle is usually caused by a multitude of different factors, uh, including oxidative stress within inside, the, uh, inside the muscle cell itself. My, uh, muscle cell dysfunction uh, concurring, ca causing impaired excitation contraction coupling. And then at the uh, muscle membrane surface, there can be a lack of excitability of the uh, muscle membrane to uh, stimulation. As you are likely well aware, the interaction between actin and myosin is, um, is a delicate balance and uh, is a complex and requires a number of different enzymatic steps to occur, any number of which of these can be interfered by, um, by, by an abnormal internal cellular environment. When you get uh, inflammation, you get an increase in reactive oxygen species and uh, nitric oxide, which directly interfere with myofibril uh, protein function and their ability to interact with uh, with with it, with themselves. There's also problems at the mitochondrial level with uh, with um, uh, direct mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, leading to the development of more reactive oxygen species and a further depletion of the energy reserves necessary uh, to uh, generate a high force contraction. At the cell at the uh, cell membrane surface. You can get dysfunction of the cell membrane um, by having an overall reduction in uh, sodium channels, uh, and the density, a loss of that density, results in a relative muscle membrane excitability. Similar to the uh, to the axons, uh, a decrease in the uh, the upstroke of uh, phase zero of the action potential uh, can lead to a much less forceful uh, action potential, lower. Amplitude and a, and a less forceful uh, contraction, uh, primarily through a loss of inflow of calcium uh, into the cell to assist in the ex, uh, um, axon myosin interactions. Now that's a lot of uh, heavy detail, and there seems to be an awful lot of work that's being done to try to understand how this, these conditions occur and how can we treat polymer, uh, polyneuropathies and polymyopathies. But really, at the end of the day, you also want to know how you're going to treat this. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of specific therapies for, for these conditions, but the good news is um, the treatment is generally the same for both uh, uh, polyneuropathies and polymyopathies. I guess it goes without saying that you should probably try to uh, aggressively treat uh, and limit the effects of SIRS and sepsis uh, because of its effects on the microvascular uh, circulation. Um, obviously, if they're not inflamed, they're not going to have the problems at the microvascular level that, uh, that cause all the problems that we've outlined. Uh, you should uh, be a very good clinician and avoid complications uh, because complications that occur uh, tend to then lead to uh, lengthenings of their ICU stay and further exposure to um, all of these toxic substances that we get tend to give patients that in fact make them sicker instead of better. There is uh, no benefit to providing anabolic steroids to this population. Uh, as I spoke recently uh, earlier there, uh, 
catabolism is the issue, but um, but switch, trying to switch them to an uh, to an anabolic state um, doesn't seem to work. Doesn't seem to benefit them, and and uh, giving them a bunch of anabolic steroids doesn't have any impact on the outcomes and probably exposes them to a hypercoagulable state. It should almost go without saying that uh, that what you should also have uh, avoid is neuromuscular blockade um, as much as possible and also avoid steroids as much as possible. Uh, unfortunately these often have to occur together um, but the, if you have to give somebody neuromuscular blockers it's far more toxic to give it to them as a continuous infusion as opposed to uh, regular uh, intermittent boluses uh, and if you're going to give them um, that kind of depth of sedation you do need to focus on daily awakenings to try and limit the amount of sedation they're getting as well as limiting the amount of um, um, uh, neuromuscular blockers they're getting. You should be uh, closely watching their glucose uh, too much and not too little. Don't let hyperglycemia become a problem for its development of reactive oxygen species but in a similar way you can't be too tight in your control of the glucose because hypoglycemia in, uh, risks increase uh, the lower you try to uh, titrate down and try to control their, uh, their glucose levels. Early mobilization uh, is probably one of the key factors that will reduce their overall length of stay and reduce their overall severity of their uh, critical illness, uh, polymyopathy, neuropathies. Because, in part because it, it also deals with a lot of these other problems. It reduces their overall level of sedation. It starts loading these muscles that are, that are not active and are being left immobile. Um, it gets them awake. It gets them participating. Early mobilization can occur even when the patient's on mechanical ventilation. I mean, I've even seen patients up and walking around while they're on ECMO. So it can be done. But unfortunately, it also requires a lot of buy-in from nursing staff and physiotherapy in, in your unit um, to make it happen. So, but clearly a worthwhile endeavor to try to get patients up and mobilized as soon as possible. And as well, if the, if the person has um, a critical illness, a polyneuropathy, it's also important to uh, focus on progressive muscle strengthening uh, exercises to, uh, to try to keep those muscles active um, and reduce their um, uh, the effects of the uh, essential effective denervation that they're already exposed to. So a lot of uh, no, no specific treatments um, that will you know magically cure your, your problem with your weak patient um, but certainly that a lot you can do from a system level to impact on, on this, uh, this very significant problem um, to uh, and also reduce your uh, patient's morbidities and their length of stay and then subsequently their long-term disability, which uh, is a very real risk uh, in this in, in, once a patient develops uh, ICU-acquired weakness. Thanks again for listening and, uh, and watching. If you have any questions uh, or comments, please feel free to contact me directly uh, or leave a comment in the uh, section below. Uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you again soon and uh, within hopefully the next couple of talks there will be I'm working on uh, a change in the uh, presentation style uh, and one that you will hopefully find a lot more uh, entertaining. And so until then, uh, have a good day and keep your muscles going.